we did number one, which were pass through securities and covered it all. Today is number two. CMO. This is or this can be one of the most complicated financial instruments in finance. Stands for collateralized mortgage. Obligation, sometimes in plural, obligations. It's a financial instrument backed by mortgages. Now, it gets confusing, and I'll just step ahead, might not be even in the textbook. You have C L O. Standing for collateralized loan obligations. Okay. And then there's another one called C M O O O C D O. which stands for collateralized debt obligations. These are the same type of financial instrument backed by the first one, mortgages. The second one and the third one are tricky. Loan and debt is kind of like the same thing. The loan will be investment grade investment grade if you remember from the first lecture means low risk high quality and the CDO when it says debt actually means junk standing for high-risk, low-quality debt. So, I haven't said it's going to take a while. <coughs> I'll be explaining. The first key is that it has tranches. That's the new concept to understand. Yes. And tranche is a French word. The legal financial term is called investor class. Investor class or bond holder class. Okay, so investor class is a class of investors which get exactly the same returns, which gets identical returns. And a CMO is a financial instrument with at least two investor classes. Usually a lot more, sometimes three, quite often five, six, seven, or eight investor classes. So each class is guaranteed its own payments. Now let's get to some explanation. Hmm? 
identical means the same. Let's say we divide you in two classes here. It's a one classroom, right? But in the one classroom, you are two classes. Here is the class A, and here is class B. You will be getting 6% return, interest return, and you're going to be getting all the prepayments on the mortgages, and you're going to be getting 8% return, and no prepayment on the mortgages. So, all of them will be getting 6 up to this part, and they're all getting 8. And it may seem unfair, but in finance, if it's unfair, obviously it doesn't work. The risk is called, I'm explaining now the whole idea, prepayment risk. Prepayment risk is the risk that the borrower, I never really defined these, let's do that while we're at it, I don't know how I forgot or why. A mortgage means, number one, a contract between a couple of people. Mortgage has a completely different meaning of secured or collateralized, secured by real estate and the third meaning of a mortgage is a loan okay now you have the person who makes the loan we call him the lender lender of a mortgage is called mortgager Okay, and the borrower is called mortgagee. Mortgagee is the borrower of a mortgage. Mortgager is the lender of a mortgage. Okay, so the Mortgagee borrower has the right at any point in time to prepay, meaning means to pay principal early in time and in advance. So, you're supposed to pay $500 a month, but instead you pay $600 a month. Out of these $500 a month, $400 is interest and $100 is principal. But if you pay six, dollars $400 is still interest, but instead of $100 interest, oh, sorry, principal, now you pay 200 in principle. So you pay and you can pay your mortgage a lot quicker if you have a little extra money. And the law, at least in the United States, says very clearly that the mortgagee can always prepay early if they want to. Well, if you got a lot of extra money or some extra money or annual bonus or money coming in or you got a better job, better pay, whatever the situation is, people do get occasionally extra money. They want to pay early so that two things happen. You pay your mortgage a lot earlier 
okay? And you pay a lot less interest. So, when you have a one million mortgage, uh, okay, let's do this, let's do this. A real world example will be my own brother who has borrowed to buy a house for 360,000, okay? And when he makes payments, he will pay off 360,000 US dollars and principal. That's in Washington, D.C. They are expensive out there. And she's going to pay roughly $700,000 in, this is principal, this is interest. Well, a lot of bankers are going to get really rich out of him. Okay, paying $700,000. So after four or five years, he says, wow, 30 years of debt slavery is too long time. He was 37 years old when he borrowed the money and he realized that he'll get to, well, he cannot get to retire at the age of 65 because he will still owe two more years of mortgages and he'll have to work two extra years. So in about year six or seven, he decided to make early prepayments. Every month he will put in extra hundred dollars, an extra hundred dollars, an extra hundred dollars. And it's a simple calculation on the internet that with just $100 more, he'll be able to pay it off instead of 30 years with 25, okay? And here's something else. Uh, his wife has an irregular job. Sometimes she gets money, sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she's got a particular, she works on projects. She works maybe four, five, six months on a project, she gets good money, let's say $5,000 a month, maybe. So, in six months, she may get $30,000 extra, okay? And then they may be three, six, nine months with no salary. So, when she gets her salary, she puts it all into the mortgage, okay? And hopefully shorten it to even less than 20 years. So, when people have money, they like to prepay for other reasons, okay? But the big one is to make the overall loan shorter and to reduce significantly the interest payments on the loan. So prepayment is an important legal right. You want to pay early. And prepayment is very uh, convenient, sorry, financially beneficial when you borrow at a high interest rate. Now, I'll give you my own example. When I was in the U.S., I borrowed at 8.75%. That was the interest rate back then. And that was in 2000, maybe August, if I remember. Could have been July. That was a long time ago. Uh, 16 years ago. Well, by 2002, in 2001, the U.S. economy had crashed, and by 2002, interest rates were down a lot. So, I was able to refinance at 5.75%. Okay. So, this is called refinancing risk. Now, let's explain. Prepayment risk is a risk to the lender that they will receive their money early and not being able to collect interest on it. Related to the prepayment risk is the refinancing. These are related. The refinancing risk is that when you receive your money early, the lender before was getting 8.75%. Now, 
he can get only 5.75%. So my savings of 3% are the lender's loss of 3%. Okay, so when interest rates fall, a lot of people will prepay early and a lot of people will refinance. Now, what does it mean, refinance? Refinance means to make or borrow a new loan to pay the old loan. So, what I did was at 575, I borrowed the full amount that I owe and I paid back my own loan. So the lender received the whole principal and never got to receive the 875 that he was hoping to receive for a long time. Now a lender of course can immediately lend again and that's exactly what they will do, but they'll collect only 575. So for them it's a major loss of 3%. It's called an opportunity cost. So refinancing risk is big and prepayment risk is big. I mean, they're pretty much the same thing. The difference in prepayment is you make some payments, maybe $100 a month, maybe $3,000 a month. In a refinancing is you pay the whole debt off completely. You take a new loan and you pay it off completely. So with a prepayment risk and a refinancing risk, the CMO now, I'm getting to the whole idea of a CMO. It's called a prepayment protection. Prepayment protection is usually given to a particular Hey guys, what's going on? If you have a question, I'm here. You can also sit on the front desk, ask the question. That's what I do. Any question? No. No? Hmm? About prepayment and refinancing. For prepayment, is it if we owe to the bank for 1000 and then we just prepay for 100 Yeah, well, prepayment simply means you pay a little bit more than what you should and it goes against the principal. Maybe you pay $50 more, maybe you pay $100 more, maybe you pay $1,000 more. In refinancing, you pay off the whole loan completely because you borrowed a new loan, you take all the money and pay back the old loan. And now you're paying a lot lower, a lot lower. All right, so before on 875, with taxes and fees and other stuff, I was paying about $900. Yeah, but this one, because it works with this little thing here, okay? That's the way it works. Okay. It's technology. And then I was able to lower it to roughly, approximately, about $700 hundred dollars payment. So, with a lower interest rate, I could have taken for the same mortgage payment, I could have taken a 20-year mortgage loan, or I could take a 700, reduce $200 my payment, and use the $200 for other spending or for other investment. So, prepayment protection, it works like this. You have investor classes. Class A and Class B. And it works the following. You, Class A, whenever there is a prepayment, you always get the prepayment first. So, you get your interest rate at 6% and at the same time, whenever there is a prepayment, you get the prepayment. They don't get the prepayment. You don't have a prepayment protection. They have a prepayment protection. Okay. So what the CMO does is separate the investors into two or three classes. Usually it will be three classes of investors. 
But let's say this will be class A with no prepayment protection. Class B with a little bit of prepayment protection. And class C with a highest prepayment protection. When there is a prepayment, and now we got, let's say, 30 mortgages. People prepay, these guys get a little bit of prepayment. More prepayment, more prepayment. So these guys keep getting all the prepayments. Well, when about a quarter of the mortgages get prepaid, it may take five, six, seven years. These guys, with all the prepayment collecting, and you do not collecting any prepayment, they will get prepaid very early. They will get all of their interest and all of their principal, maybe in about five, six, or seven years, maybe even in three years. But you never got a prepayment. You collected a higher interest and no prepayment. Now, when they're all paid off completely and they're out of the game, you continue to get your interest as promised and you continue to get your prepayments if there are prepayments and as many as they are. So for five or six years, you were completely protected from prepayments, but now all protect, uh, prepayments come to you only. These guys are still fully, completely protected from the prepayments. So maybe in the next two, three, four, five, six years, you will be collecting all the prepayments when you're fully paid off, then these guys will get a prepayment, pre the prepayments. So maybe for the first five years, the early prepayments go to them. For five years, you're fully protected. Then from year five to year nine or year 10, you're gonna be getting all the prepayments. And then when you're fully paid off by year 10, these guys will continue to get the interest and now they get all the prepayments. So they have no prepayment protection. You will have maybe for five years and then money is going to be coming fast. And these guys may get 10, 12 years of full, complete protection. Okay, well, this was five years, this was five years, and these guys got only 10 years of protection. Well, what you can do is the following. You take the whole mortgage pile, and here is class A, okay? All prepayments coming from everybody will be going to class A. Class A may have anywhere between one and three years of protection. Then class B will have anywhere between three and five years of protection. Okay. Then class C could be bigger. They may have a protection of five to ten years. Then you can have class D that will have from ten to fifteen. They may be class E from 15 to 25, and then final class F from 25 to possibly 30. These are the expected maturities. In other words, if you're class C, you know that up to year 5, you're relatively well protected, and after five, year 5, you're going to be getting most of your money back quickly. Well, if you want a lot of protection, you may get a class E or a class F, okay? And now getting back to a little bit of your question, the protection comes at a cost. The cost is that you can get your protection, but your return may be a little lower. I'm just making up an example. Oh, these guys are going to get 8% and these guys are going to get 7.5%. Okay. Uh, these guys are going to be getting 7%, maybe 6.5. These guys are going to be getting 6.3. And these guys are going to be getting 6%. So you're going to be getting a lot more, but you're uncertain how much. And it could be one to three years. It could be five years you get paid back.
It may be just two years. So you don't know exactly how quickly you're going to get paid, but at least you're going to get your 8% for sure. And then these guys are going to get their 7.5%. Again, not clear. Maybe three years, maybe two and a half, maybe five, maybe four. Okay. So the cost of protection usually is associated, usually associated with a slightly lower return. Okay. Because there is a lower prepayment risk and lower refinancing risk. Now, if interest rates in the economy fall a lot, as in 3 or 4%, a lot of people will be refinancing. These could be shortened. This could be shortened to 2, this could be shortened to 3 years, this could be shortened to 4.5 years, this could be shortened to 7 years, okay? So, depending on how quickly interest rates fall, they will accelerate prepayments. Okay. That's the prepayment risk, 207. The classes, sometimes, uh, I, I use classes A, B, C, D. Uh, sometimes they use, in the textbook, they seem to use classes A1, A2, A3, maybe A4. That's the same thing. So, this will be indicating the expected maturity of the security. Some buyers want to have a short maturity and some buyers want to have a very long maturity. So if you're a pension fund or insurance company, you may want to collect a steady interest for a long time. Well, maybe you're a financial institution, you don't want to have a maturity of 30 years or 20 years. You may shorten, you want to shorten your maturity only to two or three years. You're going to be buying these early prepayment tranches for a higher return. In other words, the idea here is that there is an investor. We use this word, you guys study marketing, right? Marketing is called a niche, niche. A niche is a group of people with very similar preferences. You know, one niche of people is they like big, heavy, thick uh, watches. Other people prefer very slim watches. One niche is people prefer watches with hands. Other people prefer watches with numbers, right? Electronic watches. Some people prefer iPhones, other people prefer Androids. Well, in investments, some investors prefer very long maturities and some investors prefer very short maturities for different reasons, okay? So that's associated with the niches and different preferences to prepayment risk. Let's see what else we got. Usually, uh, these here are associated with pension funds and insurance companies usually prefer the high maturity niches. Let's see what else we have. Sometimes, okay, things get more complicated. Except all of these classes, there's one very special class, very special class, called the Z class. Z class occasionally is known as the equity class, sometimes known as the Equity class. Equity means residual claim, whatever is left over. So a Z class is the called the last regular class, maybe out here there. So what happens is the Z class will have the highest possible 
return. They'll have the highest possible interest rate. They get a phenomenal risk. Maybe they'll get a 10% interest, okay, 10% interest, but the interest is not paid. The interest is accrued. To accrue means to add to your accounts as payable, but don't actually pay cash. So, you invest $1,000, okay, this year you get accrued of interest 10%, which is $1,100. Next year is going to be $1,200 and whatever, 10. Next year is going to be $1,300. So, you don't get any payment at all, not the principal, not the interest. And everybody else gets paid, gets paid, gets paid. If, when they get paid, and if they get paid, whatever money is left, you get all the money left over for you. So people may be paying a lot of early time, these uh, guys may get paid, they may get paid in full and even a little bit of extra. But if there is not enough principal, they'll still collect the 10% interest, but they may not get paid quite in full. So these guys, if there is money left over, they'll collect it all at the full 10%. But if there's not enough money, maybe they'll even take a little bit of a loss, okay? That's a very small percentage of the, uh, uh, maybe two, three percent of the whole thing where these guys can get a phenomenal profit if it turns out profitable, but they also risk getting quite a bit of a loss. It gets to behave not more like a bond, but it tends to behave like a stock. So that's the equity class. Let's see what else we got. Uh, in the United States, it doesn't have to be in this country, in Europe, or in any other country, there are tax consequences. Sometimes when you pass the payments through, they may be taxes, they may not be taxes. Over there, there are some uh, taxes that have to be paid. I'm not going to discuss this through. Let's see what else. Okay, mortgage passed through. Okay, another... Yeah, another different type of a CMO is called the strip. It's called a CMO strip. And the CMO strip will be a CMO with only two classes, only two classes of investors. The BO and the IO strip. The IO means interest only strip. So, whenever an interest payment is made by investors, the IO strip gets a payment. Whenever a principal makes a but it receives a payment, the PO strip gets a payment. So the payment is separated into principal and interest. And the IO, they'll be getting constantly interest, they'll be collecting constantly interest. And it's possible that their interest will be shrinking as people pay off their debt. And in a PO strip, at the very beginning, you'll be getting very small principal payments and as they get paid down, the principal part will increase. So these guys, the IO, will be getting bigger payments early on and the payments will be shrinking. And these guys will be getting very small payments early on and the payments will be increasing. Again, different investors will have different preferences. The I.O. strip has no par value. No par value. The P.O. strip will have its own. Let's see what else we got. Oh. 
Okay, well, they just provide this as a simple example of what's called, and I'll give you a break soon, financial engineering. Financial engineering is the process of creating new financial instruments. Now, in securitization means the process of creating new financial instruments from old financial instruments or from existing financial instruments. That's financial engineering. And financial engineering basically will mean how bigger slices I make. Do I make this slice 10% or 15%? Do I make the A class to be a thin slice or a big slice? Do I make the B class to be big or small, thick or thin? Now, in other words, you got a pizza. How do you make the slices? Do you want a big fat slice or do you want a thin slice. Well, some people we want it big and some people want it small. In other words, some people want short maturities and other people want long maturities. Part of the financial engineering job is to make the slices such that they are attractive to different people, to different investors, so that when an investor comes, they say, well, I want a security with these specifications, let's say maturity between five and seven years, whatever that might be, and they'll say, oh yeah, we have a security exactly for you, okay? And if you want between two and three years, they'll say, oh yeah, we got a security exactly for you. So the idea is to design security to match investors' needs. Again, it's up to you as an investment banker or a securitizer to understand what are the market's needs and to design the security to match the needs of the market. Let's see what else we got. We got some POI, I don't want to get into that. All right. Uh, Let's do, yeah, we'll do one last, uh, the, I think it's the third one over here. Okay, let's do it. Third one. Now, I'm moving on to page 212, page 212 which is number three, mortgage-backed bond. Mortgage-backed bond is page 212. Let's see what we have. Okay. A mortgage-backed bond is first and foremost a bond. It has a fixed principal, very commonly 1,000 as usual, and it has a fixed interest rate, 3, 5, 7, whatever the market is. Okay. So, it is a bond which is collateralized with mortgages or collateralized with or well, securitized with mortgage, mortgages. So it's a bond. It's got a fixed payment. It has nothing to do with prepayments or anything. It's a 10-year bond. You're going to get this kind of interest and get this kind of principal. Uh, there is no prepayment. You don't have to worry about prepayment or anything else. The only thing is called default. It is secured with a collateral. In case of a default, the investors, the lenders, seize the collateral, and the collateral is mortgages. So, 
if the bond defaults, they can take the mortgages. And again, they can keep the mortgages and collect the income from the mortgages. Or they can sell the mortgages, okay? They can do whatever they want to do with the mortgages. So it is just a straightforward bond, but secured with mortgages. Let's see what else we got in here. Uh, the mortgages remain on the balance sheet. So if you're a lender, you can finance these mortgages. Remember, in the first case, we sell the mortgages. When you sell the mortgage, the mortgage is not anymore on your balance sheet. You get all the cash for the mortgage and the, you don't own the mortgage. You don't have the risk. Here, when you issue the bond, you get the cash, but now you're collecting interest on your mortgages and you're paying interest on your bonds. The bonds will be somewhat lower risk and somewhat lower interest rate, mortgages will be somewhat higher risk and higher interest rate. So the hope for the financial institution is that you're collecting, for example, 7% on average on your mortgages and you're paying on your mortgage-backed bonds only 6%. And every month you're pocketing the 1% interest rate difference. We call it interest rate spread. You're pocketing the spread. And the name of the game is collect the spread, collect the spread, collect the spread. But if you're a financial institution, you still run the risk that the mortgages will default. You still run the risk of default. Okay. Now, at the same time, if you're an investor in these mortgage bonds, the risk is not that the mortgages will default, but that the bond issuer, the financial institution, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, whatever that institution is, that that institution will default. Well, if they default, you can still collect the bond, sorry, the mortgages. Okay, well, that's what it is. It's just a bond collateralized with mortgages. Let's see what else we have. Uh, usually, to make these loans, sorry, these bonds very, very secure, they are over collateralized. For example, a thousand dollar bond will be collateralized with maybe $1,100 worth of mortgages. So, this means that if you have this bond, you're very, very well protected. Means they issue bonds for $100 million and you get a security of mortgages worth $110 million. We say you have a 10% over collateralization. And the 10% it makes the bond very, 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 very safe. Very safe. Okay? So this is extremely low risk bond. And of course, when you over collateralize, means you put in mortgages of 110, you lose liquidity. So when you over you issue bonds, when you over collateralize them. This means you put these bonds to secure, you cannot touch these bonds, you can't sell them, you can't do anything with them. So, you take liquidity risk. You put these bonds away, you, as an issuer of these bonds, you take liquidity risk. But at the same time, but at the same time, you pay lower interest rates on the bonds. So before you were collecting 7% on your mortgages and you were paying on your bonds 6%, so you were pocketing a spread of 1% gain. If you over collateralize, 
This means a lot of liquidity risk for you. You will still be collecting 7% on your mortgages, but now because your bonds are so safe and over collateralized, you will be paying only 5% interest. So now you can double your spread. The profit from a single bond and a single pro uh, mortgage here is 1%. Here, it's 2%. You double your profit. It's extremely profitable, but the cost is increased liquidity risk. When things go bad, you can't use these mortgages for anything. You already put them aside to secure the bonds. The worst case you can do is you gotta try to somehow take a new loan, borrow a new loan so that you can pay back the bonds and when you pay back the bonds, you can release the mortgages and then sell the mortgages to pay the loan. You get into very complicated finance very quickly. But this is a way to increase profitability and return at the cost of extra this time liquidity risk. And on top of the liquidity risk, you still bear the mortgage default risk. So when the mortgage default, the issuer of the bond, Goldman Sachs or whatever, will take the risk of default. So now you're taking the default risk and you increase your liquidity risk for hopefully increased profitability. So profits and finance don't come out of nowhere. They usually come out of higher risk. All right, let's take a 10-minute break and then I'll continue. 10 minutes.